Here we are in Revelation, chapter 9. Beginning at verse 1. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. And the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, and they had a, as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Uh huh. So I'm 20 years old, and I got saved. And the first thing that the follow-up counselor says to me is, read your Bible. So I do. And I'm reading from Matthew. I didn't start with Genesis. I started with Matthew. I figured, well, the New Testament probably pertains to me. I had to start there. So I start with Matthew, and I just proceed until I get into Revelation. I'm in my parents' den, and I read Revelation chapter 9, what I just read. And it sends Holy Ghost goosebumps up my spine. And I, as I'm reading this, now as we just read it, it's pretty, pretty dramatic, isn't it? It's pretty drastic. Wanting to die. Scorpion stings. I mean, that's that's pretty heavy. So I take my Bible and I go into the kitchen where mom and dad are. And I hold the Bible in my hand like a good TV preacher. And I hold it up. And my mom and my dad were seated at the kitchen table where they would normally be when they were just conversing, having a cup of coffee or whatever. And I said, mom and dad, this is the word of God. And listen to what God's word has to say. And I opened it to where I had just been reading in chapter 9. And I read this passage to the conclusion, to verse 21. And then I, I closed it. And that's, that's when I gave my first exhortive message. I said, I don't know what this means. But I do know this. It's not speaking to me. It's speaking to you. And I point at my dad. It's, it's speaking to you. And that's when I told my dad, Dad, you're a good man. And my dad was a good man. My dad was a very good man. He would get up Monday through Friday 
at the same time. My mom would make him some coffee. She would make him breakfast. My dad would eat his breakfast, drink his coffee, get into his little pickup truck, drive into Los Angeles to go work at Davy's Warehouse. That's where he worked, a place called Davy's Warehouse. I used to think that they named the warehouse after me <laughs> when I was a little boy. And he drove what was called a bobtail, and he made local deliveries. That's what my dad did. And my dad would come home every day, Monday through Friday, at the same time, 5 to 7 to 7 o'clock. That's when he got home. Every day, like clockwork. There were times when my dad would be ill with a flu, but he would go to work anyway. There were times that my dad was on vacation. The phone would ring. My dad would go in and take somebody's route because the guy couldn't come in. I had a very productive man for a father. He was devoted to my mother. In my life up to that point and then following till the day he died, I do not re remember my father one time that I ever saw him show any undue affection to any woman other than my mom. He showed affection to her and his daughters, and that was it. There, there, there was, I could tell you stories about my father being respected by men, a hard worker, a good man, productive in every way. My mom was ill with various diseases from the time she was 24, 25 years old. My dad would work extra so that he could make money, so that he could pay for her bills for the medical doctors and a variety of things all through my life. My dad wasn't the kind of man who would go out to a store to buy himself something because he deserves it after all. His money went to his family. That was my dad. And here I am, five years of alcohol abuse, five years of drug abuse, recently saved, wild-eyed hippie, barefoot, long hair, tie-dye t-shirt type guy, holding a Bible, saying to my dad, Dad, this doesn't speak to me, it speaks to you. And that's when I pointed to my dad, and I said, Dad, you're a good man. You are the best man that I will ever know, but you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. Bow your head. You're going to receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior right now. Because, Daddy, I love you, and I do not want to go to heaven without you. And my dad, my dad bows his head. And my mom, and that's how they got saved. Revelation chapter 9. Didn't have a clue, but it doesn't apply to me. It applies to you. It applies to you, Daddy. Daddy told me later on, you know, David, when you told me I was going to hell, I wanted to get up and punch you. <laughs> the disrespect. He said, but I thought. He said, I saw the change that God had done in you. It was only three weeks. He said, I saw the change that God had done in you. He said, you were bad. You were a bad kid. You needed God. He said, but Madeline, my sister Madeline, Madeline came to faith in Christ, and he said, I knew I was better than you, but I knew I wasn't better than Madeline, because Madeline, Madeline never had dates. She didn't go out with anybody. The first boyfriend she ever had, she married. She's still married to him 30-some years later. She, she was the classic good girl, not just a good girl, the classic good girl. It would be Friday night. She's there in between mom and dad. She's eating popcorn with curlers in her hair, watching TV with them on a Friday night when she's 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. See, that was Madeline. So she was at this time 16, and she was just a good girl. And my dad said, I knew I was better than you, but I'm not better than her. And if she needed Jesus Christ, she, he said, I knew the combination of how evil you were and how good she was, he said, I knew I was somewhere in the middle. And I knew, he said, I needed Jesus. He said, now here's something important for all of you evangelists before you go home and tell your daddy he's going to hell. Let me finish this. <laughs> when you said you loved me, 
and didn't want to go to heaven without me, that touched my heart. That touched my heart. My dad, I had, n I don't remember ever, and this is not the me show, I'm just trying to explain the context. Um, my dad hadn't told me he loved me until I was 17. I don't know how many of you men know what I'm saying. I think many of you do. My father never said, I love you. He just didn't. It wasn't part of his way. He came from that generation that said, listen, I put food on the table, I put clothes on your back, I put a roof over your head, and you have a bed to sleep in. I did that for you. And if that's not love, I don't know what else is. That was my dad. But my dad never would put his arm around you. My dad would never say, I love you. The way my dad was is he'd hit me in the back of the head when I went by. And, and I finally asked my mom, why is dad hitting me in the head? Oh, your daddy's saying he loves you when he does it. That was my dad. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Any of you guys know what I'm talking about? Some of you do. Some of you do. Wow. Well, he really loves me today. I'm bleeding. But that was it. So I didn't need to hear that you love me, but dad just would never say it. That was my dad, but he was a good man, hard worker. Revelation chapter 9, my dad, I read it to him, and you just read some of it with me, and that's pretty heavy stuff. And so dad said, when you said you loved me and you didn't want to go to heaven without me, he said, that's what touched my heart. Because God used something about my dad that you see in me, and that is this. My dad loved his family. My dad would have died for us in an instant, without a thought. He loved us. We knew that. That family for my dad was everything. That was my dad. So when I, as his son, whom he loved, and I'll say this openly, the most, and it's true. <laughs> it's true. My dad had blue eyes. I have blue-green eyes. I was a little light-skinned Mexican kid in a dark brown chocolate family. <laughs> and there was just something about me that my dad had just had to sing for. So I knew that all. So when I, all, all my life, so I knew he loves me. And one day he finally told me. He says, yeah, I love, Mama said, tell him, tell him. <laughs> and he said, that's true, David. He said, I really, really love you. And that was sweet. I appreciate that. But I always knew that. But when I shared with him, Daddy, I love you. Now, that was new. He had never said that to me till I was 17. I was in a lot of trouble. And then I, I had said that to him. I don't, rem I don't know if I had said it since I was four years old. And now I'm 20. I hadn't said it in all those years. Daddy, I love you. I hadn't said it. Now I'm saying it. I love you, Daddy. And I don't want to go to heaven without you. So what am I trying to say? Let me just lay this as a foundation. When you preach the gospel, love the people you speak to. Love them. Love them. Let them know, I deeply love you. That's the reason I'm telling you this. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't say anything. But because I do, I'll tell you. And that's how it was with my dad. And by the way, sometimes when I'm teaching here and it's kind of difficult, Please understand, I love you too. And that's why I tell you the truth. I don't think a pastor should ever do anything other than tell the truth. That's what we're called to do. So getting into the passage, let's look at it together. We're examining the trumpet judgments. The trumpet judgments begin with the opening of what is called the seventh seal. Now there are three sets of judgments I've been mentioning to you about this let me just reiterate and each of these sets of judgments will gain in intensity you start with the seal trumpet the seal judgments you move to the trumpet judgments and then you conclude with what are called the bowl judgments and the greatest and most final and most horrific will be the bowl judgments now chapter 8 revealed the sounding of four of the trumpets I mentioned to you last time we were together that that is also referred to as the judgment of thirds uh, because uh, you see that a third uh, of the earth is affected in this way, the sun, etc. So it's called the judgment of thirds. 
uh, the, uh, the trumpets, trumpets were sounded by angels who were standing before God. And what they were doing is they were signaling, as we saw in chapter 8, they were signaling what are called ecological disasters. Now, the Bible reveals how the universe has been designed. And the universe is designed to bring glory to God. As a matter of fact, the design of the universe is actually part of how the Lord uh, reveals himself. It's called general revelation. And so it's actually part of how the Lord, through general revelation, draws the attention of man. He does that through his creation. In Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. So God uses creation to declare his glory. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, uh, Paul said, Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The writer of Hebrews says, Every house is built by some man, and he who built all things is God. And so creation is intended to declare certain things. It declares the glory of God. And so creation can declare the glory of God, but it can also, and this is what we're seeing in chapter 8 into chapter 9, it can also reveal his wrath. In verse 7 of chapter 8, one-third of the trees and vegetation were destroyed by hail and fire. In verses 8 and 9, a great mountain, perhaps as I mentioned last time an asteroid, was thrown into the sea. One-third of the sea turned to blood, one-third of the living creatures die. In verses 10 and 11, a star, perhaps a meteorite, falls to the earth. One-third of the springs of water become poisonous and many die as a result of that. And so the heavens are actually being used to bring ecological disasters. In verses 12 and 13, one-third of the sun, moon, and stars were struck and darkness closed in. As I mentioned to you last time, that's a temporary and partial blocking of the sun because later on that's revealed. We'll see that in chapter 16, verses 8 and 9. Jesus had spoken about that in Luke chapter 21, verses 25 and 26, when he said there'll be signs in the sun, moon, and stars on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. So we see that beginning to take place, ecological disasters, the universe is beginning to actually reel under the wrath of God, and God is now ecologically bringing judgment on the earth. And so, as, I've, as I'm saying, these are ecological. Man is impacted, but the judgments have actually been on nature. But chapter 9 records two judgments on man himself. Now, one last thing, and then we'll look at this. In verse 13 of chapter 8, he said, I looked and heard an angel flying to the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Uh, I'll just say this as a sidelight. It really isn't something worthy of speaking a whole lot about simply saying this is an angel that is warning of upcoming calamity. There was a time when satellites for, uh, the satellite for TBN was referred to as the angel. And so there were those who were saying, well, perhaps this is in reference to TBN. And I have to say, no, I don't think so. This is an angel. And the angel is warning of upcoming calamity. But the point that was being made is this. Man still refuses to repent. Here's a scripture for you, Proverbs 29, 1, for those who take notes. He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. They refuse to repent. That reveals the hardness of the human heart. So much judgment is impacting, and they still refuse to bow their knees to the Lord. Now, the three woes that the angel cries out are the last three trumpet judgments. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, is what is called the fifth trumpet judgment, the first woe that was referred to. Verses 13 through 21 of chapter 9 is the sixth trumpet judgment, or the second woe. 
there'll be a parenthesis. We'll see this in chapter 10 from verse 1 to chapter 11, verse 14. And then you have the seventh trumpet or the third woe that will sound. And so that's your introduction. Verses 1 and 2, the fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. So the seal and trumpet judgments have taken us deeply into the tribulation. And now we see the fifth trumpet sound. Notice in verse 1 how he says, I saw a star fallen from heaven. Notice how it says, to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. To him. Now we've seen things happening in what would be called the starry heavens. You see it in chapter 6, verse 13, chapter 8, verse 10, and 12. Unusual things are happening in the starry, he starry heavens. But these passages refer to what we would call material stars. But in this passage, in verse 1, it's obvious that John is not writing of a star. Notice he's referring to a person. The fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So this isn't speaking about a literal star. This is a fallen star, but it has great authority. In Scripture, there are those who would point out that angels can be referred to as stars. In Job 38, verse 7, he speaks of when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. In Scripture, there is one who would fit this description of a great or an angel with great authority, and that would be Satan. And Satan is a fallen angel. In Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20, it says, The seventy returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. But what is it that Jesus said? I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What we're looking at in verse 9 is a picture of Satan. And we're going to look at that for just a moment. Scripture records that there are various names of this arch enemy of God. One, I should point out that there are theologians who argue as to whether or not Satan is an actual being. There are those who say that there is what would be called a Satan principle. Sometimes they refer to evil as simply man-made or man-generated. But a moment ago, I just read to you what Jesus himself said. He made it very clear. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So I don't think that Jesus would agree with the theologians who say there is no such being as Satan. Jesus obviously said there is. And so let's see, I'll read this liberal theologian or I'll take Jesus at his word. I wonder which I should do. And so Jesus spoke concerning him in a literal sense. And, and when you read the Bible, you will see that he's actually referred to, but under different names or titles. He's called Satan. The word Satan means adversary. That's what the word means. He's called the devil. The word devil speaks of a slanderer. He's Lucifer. He is the accuser of the brethren. He's called Beelzebub. He's referred to as the prince of this world. He's called the prince of the power of the air. He's called the god of this age. He's referred to as the adversary, the dragon, the serpent, the deceiver. He's spoken of as an angel of light. He's the prince of demons. He's also referred to as the wicked one. Satan is real. The scripture teaches that he originally was a high-ranking angel. He was the mightiest angel. He was what it was called a covering cherub. A covering cherub was the one, was one of the angels that were actually created to be close to the glory of God. It is believed that he was originally the heavenly choir director. Interesting, huh? Want to go into music ministry? Remember that. <laughs> because he led the worship. He directed worship and praise to God. And I want to show you something about this. So what we're going to do together is we're going to change. We're going to look into Ezekiel. Let's turn our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 28. I want to show you something. Ezekiel chapter 28, because we're going to look at this, and I'm going to develop this with you. 
Ezekiel chapter 28. For some of you, that may be a new experience of opening your Bible and looking for a passage. And you may be wondering, even as I'm saying that, where is Ezekiel? Ezekiel's with the Lord. <laughs> Ezekiel. It's right after Lamentations and just before Daniel. Ezekiel chapter 28. I want to develop this with you. So beginning at verse... Uh, 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you in the day you were created. Timbrels and pipes, this is part of the reason why, incidentally, that he's called the heavenly choir director, because that speaks of musical instruments. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as profane, a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. And so this is what we're looking at. We're looking at Satan. Uh, let me show you a couple of things. Not, I'm not going to give you a thorough teaching on that passage right now, but let me give you a, a couple of things that relate to it. Now, notice how he says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. And so we know he's not speaking to the literal king of Tyre here because the king of Tyre could not have been there. So he speaks of him and he says in verse 12, for example, you were the seal meaning the model of perfection, you were wise and you were beautiful. In verse 13, he says, you were covered with precious stones. When he says you're covered with precious stones, this would remind us of the high priest as well as the new Jerusalem. The stones reflect the light of perfection. They don't re radiate their own light, but reflect God's light. And so he was a creation, but didn't have any glory of his own. It was something he was to have reflected from God. In verse 15, Ezekiel makes it clear that Satan is a created being. He's not a self-existing being. He was not created as Satan, but he became the opposer when he rebelled against the will of God. See, sometimes people will say that Satan is just a little less than God. That's an absolute lie. That is outright error. He's nothing anywhere close to God. He's a creation. He is not infinite. He's not omnipresent. He is not omnipresent omniscient. He, he has none of those qualities. He's a creation. And as a matter of fact, it says that iniquity was found in him. That word found simply means that. It was detected. And what was it that was detected? He desired what belonged to God. So verse 17 makes it clear what happened. Through pride, he left his position, and he did so voluntarily. Now, Satan has a will. And he voluntarily used it to turn away from God. How do we know that Satan has a will? Isaiah tells us in chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, for those of you who are taking notes. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. These, 
this statement, I, these are called the five I wills of Satan. The five I wills. I will ascend into heaven. This is the sin of self-seeking and self-promotion. Angels do not have the highest heaven as their lawful place of residence because that's God's domain. He says, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. He desired to possess a throne of his own and to rule above other angels. He says, I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. In other words, I will rule the earth and I will be over Israel. He said, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. Of the approximately 150 references to clouds, over 100 refer to the divine presence and glory. He says, I'm going to take that which belongs only to God, in other words. He says, I will make myself like the Most High. I'm going to be like God, a possessor of authority, and I'm going to be Lord over heaven and earth. I will take what belongs to God Almighty alone. And so as we see, Satan had eye problems. <laughs> now at the present time, and you can turn back to Revelation because I'm not going to give you as thorough a teaching as I could on this. Just wanted to touch this. At the present time, he still has access to heaven. Job chapters 1 and 2 make reference to that, how he approached God. Job 1, 6 says the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came with them. But ultimately, Satan will be restricted from heaven. And as part of the tribulation period, he will be cast down to the earth. And you'll see this in, in Revelation chapter 12. Now, I want to continue looking at this fifth angel sounded, a star fallen from heaven, to him was given the key. I want to continue that by pointing out that the Bible reveals that Satan possesses limited but great power and influence on the earth. Satan bestows kingdoms. In Luke chapter 4, verse 6, when he was speaking to Jesus, he said, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me. I can give it to anyone I want to. Satan can inflict illness. In Job chapter 2, verse 7, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Satan can buffet believers. In Luke 22, 31, uh, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Satan keeps people in fear of death. Hebrews 2, 14 says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Satan can control the weather. Job chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 speaks concerning this mighty wind that swept from the desert and struck the four corners of the homes of the children of Job. And Satan keeps people in spiritual blindness. And what is his special tactic? It's to keep people rejecting Jesus as Messiah. That is what he does. Listen, and this is just something practical to give to you. When you give the gospel of Jesus Christ, please don't get into this mentality that unless they pray with you and accept Christ, then your efforts were in vain. My responsibility is to sow seeds. Somebody else may come and water them, but the Bible tells me very clearly, but God gives the increase. So don't get caught up like a salesman because there are some people who will do the door-to-door -door ministry or evangelism ministry or mission ministry and they think if people aren't coming to faith in Christ, then I must be a failure. My efforts aren't strong enough. My wisdom isn't enough. The gospel's not powerful enough. You need to understand that it's the enemy who's blinding the minds of those who don't believe. How do I know that? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who's the image of God. And that's why you give the message and pray that God will open their understanding. That's why you do that. You just pour out that message. There are some people who will hear when you're sharing, and they will say, I need Christ. And there are other people who will hear when you're saying, what you're saying and say, I want nothing to do with him. Remember that the same sun that hardens clay will melt the wax. In the same message where somebody will hear about Christ and say, I need him, there's somebody else in that same 
room listening to the same thing saying, I can't stand anything that this person is saying. So what's our responsibility? One, you need to know that the, the people are blind, spiritually blind. And so you just give them the gospel and let God do his work. It's been said, let the lion out of the cage. You just let it go and let it do the work that God determines that that word will do. Just trust the Lord. But remember that the enemy has blinded people. And they are spiritually blind. When people get mad and they say, oh, man, I can't stand you. Jesus said, if they hate you, don't be surprised. He says, they hated me before they hated you. So it's really not you per se that they're hating so much as the message and who's being presented. And they get mad at him. Keep that in mind. And so that's what the enemy does. There's one thing, though, that I want to point out as I'm developing an introduction to verse 1. <laughs> he is limited by God. Remember that. God protects those who belong to him. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. 1 John 5, 18, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he has been born of God. But he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. Cannot when he says does not sin, does not make sin his habit and practice and way of life. It's not that we don't fail, we do, but it's not our way of life. It's not how we live habitually. Now, I'll take it a step further. Satan is aided by demons. Those are fallen angels. Because Satan is a created being, he's limited. As I mentioned, he's not omniscient, omnipotent, nor is he omnipresent. Therefore, he has legions of devils who fell, who aid him, in his rebellion. And so that's who you're looking at here in verse 1. The fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth. To them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. And so to him was given the key, notice, to the bottomless pit. The keeper of the keys has the power to open and shut. In the New Testament, a key is used, by, uh, used to denote power and authority. This bottomless pit is called the abuso. That word is used seven times in Revelation. It speaks of the prison holding some demons. It's called, we use the term, the abyss. It's a temporary detention center until the lake of fire, which is final judgment. And so this is speaking of a temporary detention center. But he's opening up this bottomless pit, and there are demons that are being released, and that's the point that he's making. Hordes of ferocious demons are allowed to escape. Now, these have been bound since the days of Noah. In Jude, verse 6, it speaks of the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. He's reserved them in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. Second Peter 2, 4 says, If God spared not the angels who sinned but cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness, they were reserved unto judgment, speaking of this place. And then in Luke chapter 8, verses 30 and 31, um, Jesus asked, What is your name? He said, Legion because many devils were entered into him, and they besought him that he would not command them to go into the deep, or the abyss, or the abuso. So it's a temporary detention center where evil spirits have been incarcerated since the times of Noah. The enemy allows them, well, God gives him the ability, or allows him to open it up, and these, these demons that are of unspeakable evil come forward. Now, 
Here's the thing. Um, we already see evil. Why would this be remarkable? It's because these were demons who were from the time of Noah. And when you read the book of Genesis and the description of what was taking place and the impact that these, these evil demons were having at that time, what we have right now are evil, but they are not equivalent to what was going to take place during the tribulation. What is going to take place is going to be more evil than any person in this room, beginning with myself, could even imagine. If you think that there is evil on the face of the earth, then there are people who deny it, that they say there's really not. That's only because they, they're really not looking. They really don't see. We're in uh, India, driving in a bus in, I believe the city was Madras. Already had been there for nine days. Saw so much poverty and pain, so much decay and sorrow that my heart was broken. I have to be honest with you. There's just something about seeing these babies begging everywhere you go. Millions of people in poverty. The stench of decay. Seeing somebody next to a, a small lake bathing, next to them somebody is washing their clothes, and next to them is somebody with a pot bringing water out of that dirty water with the pot that taking water to go cook with it, to smell and to see, to go into a temple to see what they do there, and to see babies, young kids, four, five, six years old, with their hands out asking for food when you walk in and you watch the, the people who are there going into the, into the temple, you see them walking past the children so they can take grain and feed rats. And I've seen that. I've been there. I've seen it. Where they go past the children who are begging for food to go and give their grain offering to rats that inhabit that temple. And I'm driving with a friend of mine, well, with the whole team. We're driving in this bus. And I look on the sidewalk. And 40 feet from me as we're driving by in this two lane, on the corner, I see a little girl who was probably three years old, laying naked on a, on a three by four sheet of cardboard. That was her bed. And when I see this little baby with her mama sitting next to her, my heart was absolutely, that was it. I can't take any more of this. This is breaking my heart. And you know where the team is being taken? To a place where they, they call it ladies in cages, women in cages. It's where the prostitutes are literally placed in cages, like kennels. And there are women in there who have become impregnated, who are raising their babies in these cages. The one who would argue and say, there's no evil, they're blind. There is such evil in this world. There is. There's evil, but it's going to be worse when these ferocious, evil demons that have been incarcerated since the time of Noah are released and finally have their opportunity to do the evil that they desire to do. So for those who are here during that time, it's going to be horrible. It says in verses 3 through 6, out of the smoke locusts come upon the earth, and they had great power. Locusts. Now, when you read this, some say they are most likely demonically energized. Others would say this is really simply a picture of demons. But what we have is a cloud. It's a cloud-like smoke that covers the sun. There are so many is the point it's making. Now, the locusts have a scorpion sting, and they harm those who are rejecting Jesus. They have no authority to kill, he says, but they can inflict incredible pain. 
Now, remember we had read about the 144 evangelists? Well, they're protected, as well as the others who have been saved. But those who are getting stung, notice the pain is suffered for five months. Now, I was reading about scorpions, and a scorpion sting can produce pain for several days. Scorpion stings can be so powerful that they might even kill children. So the pain is intense. In verses 7 through 10, it speaks of the shape of the, lo the locusts. They're like horses prepared for battle. Now, I want you to notice that he says they're like. He keeps using the word like. This may indicate that something other than a little interpretation would be intended. They're, they are portrayed, though, as being fierce. They're portrayed as being evil. They're portrayed as being powerful. There's a description, woman's hair, lion's teeth. But the way that this is, is presented Notice verse 10, they had tails like scorpions, were stings in their tails. Their power was a hurt man five months. They had king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name was he, in Hebrew is Abaddon, in Greek he's Apollyon. Well, as they're speaking concerning this, it could be a description of, of a literal locust, of course, and there are others who would say that it could be a, a picture of something other than that, perhaps even a, a description of, of a helicopter, like a cobra helicopter. And some have said, well, this is a possible that it's possible that they may be Cobra helicopters spewing nerve gas. That we don't know, but there are those who would postulate that. It says they are portrayed as being immune from destruction because they have armor. Now, notice again, they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. That helps us to know that they may not be literally locusts because Proverbs 30, 27 says locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. What we actually are seeing here for sure is this. Satan's character is revealed. He is destruction and he is destroyer because the name in Hebrew is Abaddon, destruction. In the Greek, he has the name Apollyon, destroyer. So Satan is destruction and destroyer. He is identified. One last thought, and then we'll, we'll close with prayer and we will worship the Lord because we're not going through this. Thank you, Jesus. Um, have you, have you, I don't want to make this too personal, but let me say it like this. I have had the opportunity of seeing someone die and to see the pain they're in? Some of us have. My mama was in such terrible pain in her last few days, last few months. Terrible pain, terrible pain. She had broken her back. She, she used to wear a little bag that gave her such trouble. Her hands were so arthritically crippled that she, she couldn't even hold a spoon. Mama was in terrible pain. And do you want to know, some of you who have been in this church, if you don't mind, let me be personal in this way. When my father went home to be with the Lord, that was a sudden thing that I didn't expect. My dad was well one day, and he was dead three or four days later. I was not ready for that. And some of you, some of you in this, in this room perhaps were with us years ago when my dad went home to be with the Lord. And, and some of you, I know I can look out and recognize some of you. Uh, you, you went through the pain with me. You saw me suffering up here. The pain of such a sudden departure, something I wasn't ready for. It took a long time for me to finally, <sighs> daddy's with Jesus, but it was painful. But mama died last year. My mama died a little over a year ago. And I haven't done the same thing. And some people might say, well, he really was upset when his dad died, but it seems like his mom's death didn't affect him the way his dad's did. Here's the reason, because I prayed, Jesus, either heal her or take her home. Heal her or take her home, Jesus. She's in such pain. And Lord, I know that, I just know that you're going to take her home. So when my sister was holding her, my mama in her arms, and my mom breathed her last, died in the arms of her little girl, 
and my sister calls me up and says, Mama died. I had sorrow, but not like I had for my father. Why? Because I had been saying, Jesus, please take Mama home. She needs to go home. She's in such pain. Please take her home. So it wasn't like a relief. I can't say that. But the burden was yielded. Easier. Imagine you crying out for five months. I need to die. The pain is so intense. And you cannot die. You're in an accident. And your body is torn up. And the pain is racking. But you cannot die. Death is suspended. The scorpion sting, the pain, and the crying out. What a terrible picture. What a terrible picture for five months. And they can't die. And they can't die. This reveals the character of the enemy. He is destructive and he destroys. He's referred to as the king. It speaks of his authority but it also shows what kind of foe we have, what kind of foe we have. But I rejoice to know that Jesus crushed his head. Jesus destroyed the destroyer. 